Hello, we're here together one more time to dig into God's Word. I hope that this is exciting for you. It's fun to mine out the nuggets of truth and wisdom and, and good that God's put into His Word. Let's pray, and then we're going to jump into our subject one more time. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we praise You and thank You for Your Word. Now teach us. We are absolutely dependent on the Holy Spirit to uh, show us what it is that we should grab hold of and, and, and learn and, and go from. So you be the one who is the leader. I'm going to speak, but let the words be yours. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty, here we go. What we started into last week was how important is the account of creation as the Bible gives it to the whole story that is recorded in God's Word? Is it necessary that you believe the way that it was presented in Genesis 1 through 11? As many people have done, they have started uh, thinking that that's all not necessary for you to think that that's accurate or, or a, a real account. But the fact of the matter is that as, it's, as God's creation is described in Genesis, to explain, uh, it explains a lot of the realities of God and of what we know about him. And we learn from that a basis for all the rest that's in the Word. And we're going to just keep picking out places in the Word that refers to the Lord and how he created. And we're going to see that the Bible says that the creation record is a true account, not a fairy tale. It's God-breathed and profitable, the Word of God is. This is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, tells you specifically that it is the breath of God that's been given life to these words. So let's look. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 10. We're going we're gonna to start here. Jeremiah 10. This is a interesting and, and a little bit um, sarcastic account in which Jeremiah talks about those who are idolaters. And in his day, literal idolatry was, was a big deal. It was huge. And it drew away from people who were devoted to and following the Lord. And often the idolatry that they practiced included some vile things that were, that were definitely against what God had instructed. When well, Jeremiah 10, he, he reasons out that someone gets and uh, goes to the forge and makes tools with which they can carve wood. And then they go out and cut a tree and drag the log in. And they cut a part of it. And part of it they put in the stove to heat the place keep them warm and part of it they put into the wood-fired ovens to bake their bread and make their meals and then the other part of it they whittle into a god and they put set it up somewhere and nail it down so it won't fall over and then they start bowing to it and praying to it and uh, another place to look at the same type of thing is in Isaiah chapter 44 verses 9 through 20 in which it tells the same thing and both of these authors are saying does that sound reasonable to anybody that they would whittle out their own God and then think it had the power to do anything for them? And of course, those idols were symbols of what they thought was out in the, out in the unseen world. But the fact is that, that um, making a God out of those things was a futile, futile thing. Well, in our work day, we might say, well, it's not very... Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's stupid to bow down to an idol, of course. And yet in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5, it says that greed is a form of idolatry. Where we take something and we put it in front of the Lord and give it importance and think you just got to have that. It's, it's just vital for our, for our happiness and, and stuff. And, and Paul says that's idolatry. That's putting something in the place that God is supposed to occupy. He is to be the desire of our heart. He's to be what we are seeking and going after. Not junk, not stuff, not anyone, not an ideal, not a position of power. Nothing that we are greedy for and go after is worthy of the place that God should occupy as first and foremost in our minds, in our hearts. You get down to Jeremiah uh, 10 verses 6 through 10. And it, uh, it, it contrasts the Lord, who is, the, and in, in verse 7, it actually says, there's none like you, God, even though other people raise things up and bow down to them and worship them. 
But then you get to verses 11 through 16, and it says this, Thus you shall say to them, The gods that did not make the heavens and the earth will perish from the earth and from under the heavens. They're on a limited time offer. But in verse 12, it is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom, and by his understanding has stretched out the heavens. So it, it, it says that the creation of the world demonstrates three things about God in particular. One is his power, the fact that he could speak matter into existence, that he could take his energy and create it to be something solid that that is fixed in that we can stand on or 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 that has life and grows this comes from his power he established the world by its wisdom we know that the world is on a balance that many things depend on where our planet is located in our galaxy uh, how much sunlight and how much darkness we get the tides of the that are influenced by the moon all of these things are done with wisdom and in fact Recently, I, I had a, a leg injury, as I had told you about a few weeks ago, and the fact is that the more they explain about how the system works and the lymphatic uh, system that affects our bodies and, and, and does its job for us, the more you see, this is an absolutely intricate and detailed design that any part of which doesn't work right and you're sunk. you got big problems. God showed his wisdom in his design. And by his understanding, he stretched out the heavens. He's the one that set the globe spinning, that made the orb, the, the shape that, that planets and, and stars and the earth has. He's the one who, who set up, because he not only had the wisdom to do so, he understood how things had to be. He understands us. And you see this as you look at how the world is made. The creation is a testimony, and it's a testimony because of his specific and direct doing of it. We're going to see more of that in a little bit. But he shows his, his creating power and wisdom and understanding. He's the maker of all this. Verse 16 says, The portion of Jacob is not like these, like those idols, for he, the, he, the maker of all is he. It's his design and his creation. It's what he's done. To compare God with other things people get to worship in is not even comparing apples to oranges. You know, when people say you got to compare apples to apples, it means you got to compare the same thing. Then we say not apples to oranges because they're two different fruits. Well, when looking at God compared to other things, it's not even like apples to oranges. It's like apples to mud pies. They don't even exist in the same realm at all. When you put God in comparison to anything else, he stands alone. And there's just a little side note. Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 12 through 18, he repeats again in chapter 51, verses 15 to 19. In both places, he makes the point that God and can and will do as he has said he would do. What is shown about God would have shown that he is the origin of all, that in the light of his creative power, how could he be stopped from doing anything that he declared he would do? And because he's eternal, he is not rushed by time to get something done when we think he ought to do it. It's according to his plan and his purpose that he does and has done what he has done. Let's go to another one. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 27. In Jeremiah 27, God sends a message uh, by his prophet Jeremiah. And he says, I have a message for you to alert kings to what is coming. And he, and he says, I'm going to explain to you why God has the right and the power to do what he chose to do. So Jeremiah 27 verse 5 says, I have made the earth, the men and the beasts which are on it, which are on the face of the earth by my great power and my outstretched arm. And I will give it to the one who is pleasing in my sight. Now kings often think they have the right to be in the position as they do. Well, they do if God declares it. But it, the one that he does not want to be there, he can push aside just as easily as can be. Kings don't bear weight to demand how, that God do something. 
and he has the right to do so. And that's the message to the kings. He says, I'll give it to the one who is pleasing in my sight. This is the one that I have determined. This is what I will do. And Jeremiah goes on and he writes in one place about Nebuchadnezzar, who is going to be the one coming. And God is going to give him dominance as he goes to each of the kingdoms that he faces. So he'll be victorious. This is God's doing. Let's look over at uh, Jeremiah chapter 32. In Jeremiah 32, and we're especially going to look at verse 17, Jeremiah's praying, and he begins by referring to God the Creator. He says, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. So it points to God's power that he has without limit which is something that each of these references often point to. You see God in his great power doing what he chooses to do, making things be that had not ever been before, stopping something that he chooses to stop. But then it goes on and it talks about his outstretched arm. There's an interesting thing in the Word of God. Through the Old Testament, we, we read about his, the work of his fingers, his outstretched hand, his outstretched arm, his bared arm, meaning he's rolled up his sleeves like he's getting to work. All the time when it keeps referring to this type of a thing, his outstretched arm, it means that he acts to make something truly happen. He doesn't only hold great potential, but he does great things. And when you see a reference to to his arm, to his mighty hand, to his, his bared arm that he's rolled up his sleeves, it means that he's truly done something or is getting ready to do something for real. He's going to reach in and cause in our lifetime something that we'll see the effects of. He has done in the past. He will do in the future. He's not limited. And there there's something in my mind that's really really uh, descriptive of saying, all right, he's rolled up his sleeves, he's getting to work, and he's, he's going to do it. That's what God does. So it says it's by his outstretched arm and his great power. While well, we're in Jeremiah, let's look back. Jeremiah 33, if you would, verses 20 to 26, where it says this. He's using creation to say how sure you he is how sure that we can depend on his promises. If you look here, um, starting with verses 20 to 22, it says, Thus says the Lord, If you can break my covenant for the day and my covenant for the night, so that day and night will not be at their appointed time, then my covenant may also be broken with David my servant, so that he'll not have a son to reign on his throne and with the Levit Levitical priests my ministers. And you jump on down to verses 25 and 26. Thus says the Lord, If my covenant for day and night stand not, and the fixed patterns of heaven and earth have not been established, then I would reject them, the descendants of Jacob and David my servant, not taking from his descendants rulers over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's saying, if you can stop the earth from rotating, because that's where day and night comes from, then perhaps you could stop God from fulfilling his promises. Even then it wouldn't be sure, but once you stop the earth from rotating, what would be left for the rest of us? You know that this would become a, a smashed thing, something not worth, not worthwhile at all. Look at what it says. It says, how sure are the promises of God? It's... Uh, Let's look at one more place in Jeremiah 31. Look at Jeremiah 31, verses 35 to 37, where it says this. Here's what God says. Thus says the Lord, Who gives the sun for light by day, and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that the waves roar, and the Lord of hosts is his name. Listen. Listen. When you look into the Word, you find out that the way that things work, the cycle of what we look at and say, well, that's just the natural cycle. That's what the planet does. The tide comes in, the tide goes out. The sun comes up, the sun goes down. The moon rises, the moon goes through its phases. And you say, these are just natural cycles. This says that God fixed that order, that God caused the movement. He causes the, the, the stars from our perspective, to change as the seasons change through the year. He did that on purpose. 
and end verse 36. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel will also cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out below, then I will also cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. Today, modern science is still boring into the center of the earth, trying to figure out just how is this globe made? What's in the middle? What's in the, in the layers leading up to it? And, and we still wonder we don't know. But God knows, and it says that since he's the one who said it, since he's the one that made the, the natural cycles, the, what we call the, the flow of nature, the way that it occurs, um, these are things that are established by God. Romans 11.29 says, For the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. They, he doesn't ever take them back. He says, once they're made, they will be accomplished. And their security is based on his demonstrating the power and intent that went into his creation. He established the very turning of time in this universe. Now we're talking about big things. Can you open your mind to understand how huge this is? Especially in our day and age when we keep putting better and better telescopes out from the earth where we can take pictures far into the universe and, and, and trying to get to, if there's an outside edge to where we are. God established that. And the more we discover, the more our understanding of how massively huge the knowledge, power, and wisdom of God is. And of course, there's such a tendency to say, well, it's so huge, no being could do this. It's because you've written off God and what he's trying to tell us from what we discover. What we're seeing is, Jeremiah had a firm grasp of the truth of God's creating, his setting in motion of all that is. And it's a good reason to believe that everything that God says. The fact that you can look outside and see rainfall and the sunrise and the things that happen should be a testimony that when God sets something going, when God says this is how it will be, that's how it will be and you need to trust him. So the account of creation, because it tells you this was God's direct hand that caused it to be in the time frame that he chose it to be, then you're to trust in God for the salvation that he offers as well. Draw the right conclusions. Don't write off part of it because someone has decided that the miraculous and the existence of God isn't possible. Instead, look at the evidence and say, what has God done? And this is how what he's done. And this is what we're supposed to draw from there. If we look at the Psalms, we're going to just start into this. We won't go very far before we before we're done with uh, before we call a halt to this session. But the Psalms use creation as a basis for the praise and honoring of God. There are real reasons to praise and declare His glory. Now, we talk about the glory of God. I want to take just a note here to say this: God's glory refer, refers to His excellence and His holiness. That is a part of his being, his, his who he is. It, his uh, glory sometimes is seen when it's revealed to people. It's seen as light. And it's seen as light so intense that it can't be approached or accessed or penetrated or even survived by anyone from outside it unless he protects them. His glory is connected to the praise and the thanksgiving that we direct toward him. It appeals directly to the glory of God, the praise and honor of God, the being and holiness of God when we bring praise and thanksgiving to him. If you want some scriptures to look up, 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16, tells us that God dwells in unapproachable light. And in Exodus 33 and verse 20, the Lord makes it clear that people can't even see God it, without protection from him with, and survive it. So, let's begin with a psalm. Psalm 8 is the one that we're going to look at. Psalm 8 is recognize God's power and glory in, in the very fact that we exist here. It begins in the first verse, and this is a great introduction. 
O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who displayed your splendor above the heavens. O Lord, Yahweh, that word, that name means, O the great I am. He is the originator, the one who is. Everything else has come from him. He's the source of it all. O Lord, great I am. Our Lord. He's identified and said, come to me. I want to have a relationship with you. I want you to feel the warmth of my light. I want you to know that I'm there. He's our Lord. How majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. He said, your, your splendor, the, the glory, the greatness of your work spreads farther and farther. As far as we can see, it's still far, not far enough to encompass all that you are. And then in verse 2, from the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you've established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. This is an incredible thing. We consider God's works, verse 3 calls them, the, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, and it says it's just finger work of God. It's the stuff that he did, you know, like it's the light work, him making and doing all. But it also tells you in verse 2, from the mouth of infants and nursing babes, he has established strength. Every cry of every newborn baby is a testimony to God's grace and power. That person would not be there unless God had put him together. That voice would not cry out unless God breathed the life into him. It's, we look at it like it's some natural process, and yet the very fact that we can reproduce people from from ourselves is from God and he isn't detached from it's happening so somebody brings up well what about when a kid's born with down syndrome or when a kid's born blind or when a kid is born with with incomplete limbs does that fly in the face of what God's done what that does is those beings are often used to bring people to the place where they realize there's something more important than my career, than whether I'm comfortable all the time, than whether I have lots to retire on and never have to work again. Those things are what it gets in the way of when we have to slow down, take the time. And we're to take the time. Those children often are a reason to bring worship to God, to bring glory to God, to remind us that we need him, that none of us are complete without him. It's not some evil that has come. It is God at work. And I know that there sometimes are conflicts. The things that we have done, the sin that has entered the world, gets in the way of, of, of things at times. And little kids are born with, with, uh, with some don't survive their birth and, and stuff. I'm not trying to make excuses and say. But the cry of every newborn baby is a cry to the greatness of God, is declaring the glory of God. From the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you've established strength. You've told of your greatness. You've shown what you do. Because of your adversaries, to make the enemy and the revengeful cease, life goes on. Even in the midst of war, in the Ukraine right now, where war is happening, women are still giving birth to newborn babies who will have a future that they don't know, that they don't see yet. God gives his voice in the weakest of places. The cry of a newborn baby. There's nothing nothing that is, is weaker than that. Nothing as helpless as that. And yet it declares to us how helpless we are without the living God. His power, his wisdom, and, and the fact that he cares about what happens with us. And so the, the lessons there, the goodness is there the power of God is there it says here in Psalm 8 verses 3 and 4 when I consider your heavens and I work your fingers the moon and the stars which you have ordained it makes you have a big view you look out and you say look at this what God's done then it says then it makes me think about me what is man that you've thought of it that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him 
Yet you made him a little lower than angels, or some translations say a little lower than God. And you crown him with glory and majesty. It means you put so much into him. There's potential. There's, he's creative. He's smart. He's, he's wise. He, he learns things. He grows. He writes poetry. He, he, he does art. He, he builds things. And, and all of these things that you put into him, you've given him all that. And yet, what is that to what you've done? Nothing. It's, it's little and measly. And yet, you've done that. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet, all the sheep and oxen, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the seas. It says that we are put in charge of that. And that reminds me that we're going to have to be looking and say, what is our responsibility to this creation? What is it we're supposed to be doing with the earth? For someone to be dumping junk in rivers, for someone to be dumping trash in the ocean and polluting and getting rid of things, for someone to wipe out whole species of animals, fish or, or birds, in their greed because they can get something from it. What a shameful way to be handling the creation of God. It's been put into our care of what let's care for it. He calls us to take care of what he's entrusted to us. We can go on and on here, but this ends the same way it began. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. He says, all of this adds glory. All of this lifts up your name. It reminds us of your greatness, of your power, of your majesty, of your, of your um, great wisdom and insight and understanding. This is, that was Psalm 8 that we've just gone through. What we're going to do is pull the plug right there because we're going to come back next time and continue in this. But I want you to understand, and I want to understand. Do you, under, do you know that when I talk to you, I'm learning? And as I'm thinking through these things and as I'm explaining to them, I too am reflecting once again on the greatness of the glory of God as demonstrated in his creation. And he doesn't ever give up on that basis by which the whole story, the whole account of what God does, why he does it, that he has a right to do it, and how salvation is offered, is based on his title deed to all that is made, because he's the one who created it all. We're going to get real specific in this over the next little while. Reflect on these things to begin with. We'll continue on next time. God bless as we think of him in the way that he has presented himself in the word. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done. There's a whole lot here, and it's a big chunk to bite off. But I pray that you would expand our minds to make us able to do so. Let us be people who are excited about the hand of God and giving you the proper respect and glory for what we see. Thank you. We praise you. We ask you to have patience with us because we're kind of slow to get it sometimes. But we pray that you would help us to get it. Be our teacher. Be our guide as we look through these things. We praise you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Look around you. Look at the stars. Look at the sky. Today in, in Alaska, it's, it's uh, raining like crazy or in, in Anchorage here. And uh, even that expresses the glory of God because it talks about the blessing of God's dripping down waters. It gives life. And you ought to see how things are growing. It's amazing. God bless you. God keep you. God guide you as you think on the things of the